5030. So this is session 5030, Space-Based Earth Observation, Climate Information for Society. This is the first of three parts today. Um, and then we will have just a, as a highlight after the plenary, we will have a session that has a DG panel. So the Directors General from Environment and Climate Change Canada, from uh, the Canadian Space Agency and from and our CAN will be here to talk to us about the satellite Earth observation strategy that the government put out in January. So it'll be a great interactive learning opportunity. So I encourage everyone to come back for the whole rest of this. So I'm gonna hand over to Adam. You're gonna do the intros, I'll do the timing. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Keely. Yeah. Hi everybody, this is Adam Barassa from the University of Saskatchewan and I'm chairing this session together with Dr. Kaylee Walker. And our first speaker for today is Thomas Piekatowski from the Canadian Space Agency uh, presenting on the Hawk mission. Go ahead, Thomas. Hello, can you see my screen? Yep, looks good. Okay, so um, I'm here on behalf of a very large team of people from the Canadian Space Agency, a large university consortium, Environment and Climate Change Canada, the National Research Council of Canada and Canadian industry. We've been working for the last three years on a study and uh, um, be taking you through uh, the an introduction. I'm pre pre presenting an overview and there will be several other speakers today going into much more detail. Uh, the um, acronym is HAWK high altitude aerosols, water vapor, and clouds. It is a proposed Canadian contribution to NASA's Atmosphere Observing System, AOS. It integrates three innovative Canadian scientific instruments. The aerosol limb imager, which flies on a Canadian spacecraft, spatial heterodyne observations of water show, which makes water vapor measurements, also flying on a Canadian spacecraft, and tick fire, thin ice clouds in the far infrared emissions that will fly on a NASA spacecraft. These three instruments on two spacecraft will make coincident measurements of the same air mass. In the image on the left, you see uh, the NASA Polar Orbiting AOS P1 uh, right above the North Pole. Tick fire would have a nadir view, so straight down, along with the other instruments that are on that polar spacecraft. The Canadian spacecraft called AOS P2, or well, we haven't really given it a name, we're calling it Hawk Satellite it would be flying um, either before or after, preference is to lead the NASA spacecraft so that it can look backwards uh, as it's going over the North Pole for better uh, remote limb sounding uh, uh, in the upper uh, or the Northern atmosphere, uh, Northern hemisphere, sorry. Uh, it would be about 2,400 kilometers ahead or before or behind the NASA spacecraft. That is about five minutes. Um, and that's the, the distance required for the limb viewing instruments, Ali and Sho, to be uh, viewing the same air mass at the same time as the Nader instruments. The image on the right shows the proposed constellation of the atmosphere observing system. There are two orbits. The inclined orbit has a NASA spacecraft carrying, well, uh, that's in the upper right corner. It carries a NASA instrument and a French instrument. In that same orbit is a Japanese um, a spacecraft carrying its own uh, radar and a, a French instrument. And in the polar orbit uh, is the large NASA spacecraft with multiple NASA instruments and one Canadian instrument, and then the Canadian spacecraft. So this is one constellation. 
but multiple projects, NASA projects, French, Jap Japanese, and Canadian projects, all for synergistic science. And when I'm talking about open science, NASA is pushing the boundaries where they, the vision is to do everything in open science, not just the data, but the publication or the uh, code, the algorithms, uh, much of the information that is developed during development of the mission. So we see here again on this slide, what I just spoke about, there's a backscatter LIDAR on the NASA spacecraft. There will be two microwave radiometers from CNES, the French mission. They will be, they are identical. They will observe Delta T, so uh, making observations over uh, several minutes in time. It's about two and a half minutes, I believe. Um, the uh, NASA instruments are high spectral resolution LIDAR and a KAW band Doppler radar, as well as a microwave radiometer and polarimeter, and then uh, Canada's uh, thermal and far infrared radiometer tick fire. The, the Canadian instruments will help to uh, expand the coverage from those very, uh, the, the narrow footprints of the LIDAR and radar to a wider swath. The atmosphere observing system is a major element of the Earth System Observatory that was announced by the Biden-Harris administration a year ago. And if you're interested, I would uh, suggest that you look it up. On, there are some websites here, that, excellent websites for the AOS and the Earth System Observing System. Uh, aerosols and clouds convection precipitation is what the mission was called up until uh, last uh, year, well, up until uh, less than 12 months ago when it was named the AOS. And it represents really the, the lion's share of this investment in the Earth System Observatory. The science and applications traceability matrix links the uh, AOS science goals to the geophysical variables and the observations to be made by other satellites. The other satellites like meteorological satellites are called the program of record missions. And those can include uh, other NASA missions as well as uh, international missions of importance. There's the orbital segment. And then there's a very important suborbital segment because you simply can't make all the necessary measurements from satellites, you need to have ground-based and airborne measurements. And this is an integral part of this mission. It's designed in from day one. Uh, there are other um, documents available on the internet. Uh, these uh, links on the, on the bottom point to the uh, application, science and applications traceability matrix and to a science narrative, very well done. The AOS constellation will provide data to support a wide range of applications, including public health through aerosols, water resources because of the precipitation, disaster monitoring. It's expected that AOS will provide insights into improving uh, numerical weather uh, system um, models. Uh, of extreme weather events. Hawk, the Canadian mission, represents a co cohesive Canadian mission within a NASA-led international mission. The ALI, show and tick fire instruments are highly synergistic with each other and the NASA instruments. Um, I know that uh, uh, the other speakers after me will go into this more in detail, so I won't uh, describe the, the, the linkages between these any further. Um, I, I, I just saw that Jan will also have this information in his uh, presentation. So I'll let him do the, the talking about that. Um, the Canadian instruments have strong synergies between themselves 
and with the NASA missions, they fill in gaps that simply wouldn't be covered um, by the, the AOS uh, baseline instruments. Um, science innovation, the first ever spectral infrared imagery covering nearly the entire thermal emission region, including the far infrared. This is currently an observational gap where most of the thermal cooling takes place and is the prime driver of severe weather in winter storms. Uh, climate uh, uh, cr cr providing information about critical ice cloud characteristics and microphysical properties with a focus on the Arctic. Uh, water vapor uh, and in the UTLS uh, is uh, extremely important uh, driving many processes. Uh, aerosols, uh, especially the tenuous aerosols in the stratosphere and upper troposphere. I'd like to say a few things about the Canadian University Consortium. This is really outstanding. I haven't seen this in my career at CSA where a Canadian a uh, consortium of now 11 instruments coast to coast have uh, worked together, formed and worked together over the winter to prepare a proposal to the Canada Foundation for Innovation Fund for science infrastructure. They're also formulating a proposal for matching grant funding from INSERCs, Alliance grants, and the plan is to propose for major funding from New Frontiers and Research Fund to expand severe weather and climate science to other important sectors of the economy and government policy. Hawk mission is very well aligned with Canada's new strategy for satellite earth observations. You're going to hear more about this from the three director generals of uh, environment in our CAN and CSA uh, or later on today, but it addresses all these points of access to open data, domestic and international partnerships, climate change mitigation and adaptation, key environmental and health indicators, and promoting education. CSA investments in the Hawk started in summer of 2019. That was shortly after the ACCP study was initiated in December of 2018. That led to uh, instrument user requirements documents, modeling and simulations contract. We'll hear more about that in a few minutes. Instrument studies for technology and design optimization and costing. Those studies will now be feeding into further studies related to the spacecraft and ground segment, as well as science development. Uh, we also are um, initiating a high altitude uh, capability demonstration on NASA ER2, this flies in the stratosphere, as well as technology development projects, contracts to reduce risk. In, re in terms of the NASA milestones, uh, we just went through the AOS mission concept review. This was about 80 people at Goddard Flight Center, uh, Space Flight Center in uh, mid-May, went very well. Uh, NASA will uh, expects to uh, have their key decision point in uh, A in September to start their phase A officially with a uh, phase B official project start in July of 2023. The inclined launch will be in 2028 and the polar launch in December 2030. So that's my last slide, Katie. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Uh, beautifully in time. Adam, over to you for questions. Yeah, okay. So I don't see anything in the chat. Questions, anybody? I put a few more slides into backup about the instruments um, and the, um, the uh, Canada strategy for satellite earth observations. Um, I don't know how this uh, presentation is being shared uh, 
will the hyperlinks flow through, do you think? Mm, good question. I'm not sure, Kaylee. Do you know? I think, I think things are being recorded. I don't know how the presentations are shared, but I'm sure that we can put people in touch with you, Thomas, oh, okay. if they'd like to get uh, the deck from you. All right. Good. Okay, last call for questions. Then okay, I'll... let's move on then. Thanks, Thomas. You're welcome. Okay, our next speaker is Landon Rieger from the University of Saskatchewan, uh, also talking to us about the Hawk mission and specifically the end-to-end -end simulation. Go ahead, Landon. Oh, can't hear you, Landon. I don't think you got your mic on. There we go. Is that work? Much better. Yeah, good. All right. Okay. So Thomas gave a great overview of the Hawk uh, mission here, so I won't go into too many details there. But just in case anybody from the West Coast is tuning in late, um, Hawk is a proposed Canadian uh, mission, and it would focus on high altitude aerosol water and clouds in the upper troposphere and lower stratosphere. And there's three instruments uh, that I'll talk about today, two that view from the limb, the aerosol limb imager and spatial heterodyne observations of water. And then the nadir viewing instrument, uh, thin ice clouds and far infrared emissions. So all of these instruments have quite a bit of heritage in terms of balloon measurements and aircraft campaigns. But they're pretty novel in terms of satellite instruments, um, as well as their interactions. So we wanted to look at um, a few different questions uh, to answer for this work. So in terms of the instruments, we want to look at whether the data products and the, and the instruments will meet the target requirements. And then we also wanted to do some feedback uh, on the design to look at different design trade-offs that could be made. And then in terms of the uh, data products themselves, uh, we wanted to look at whether we could improve the retrieval algorithms, and then how to combine the different products uh, from Ali Show and Tickfire. And then we also wanted to look at whether we could, uh, how best to foster the synergy between Hawk and the larger uh, AOS mission concept. And so to answer these questions um, really requires diving into the details. So we need to understand uh, the measurement noise uh, from the instruments, their point spread functions, um, how that flows into the uh, sensitivity in the Jacobians, as well as the, the averaging kernels of the retrievals. And so to do that, we really need um, full end-to-end -end simulators, right, from measurement to retrieval. And so that starts at the atmospheric scene. And for this, we focused on aerosol clouds and water vapors, of course, uh, but we also have to include some additional properties like surface uh, albedo and those kinds of things. And getting a good end-to-end -end simulator, it's really critical to have a, an accurate and detailed atmospheric scene. So we put quite a bit of work into this um, and we've combined information from different uh, model products. So we've looked at uh, output from ERA-5 as well as the earth care scene that's produced from GEM. So that's the, the figure shown here. But we've also combined various satellite measurements as well. So we've looked at um, cloud uh, scenes from the Calypso space-based LIDAR, as well as some limb sounding instruments like OM. So we put quite a bit of detail uh, into the atmospheric scene as the input. And then the next step um, is to propagate the radiance through that atmospheric scene to the instruments themselves. So for this, we've used SASTRAN for the limb instruments and MODTRAN for the nadir viewing. And then the next step is the instrument simulators themselves. So here we take the front end radiance and produce a simulated level one measurement. And so this goes through and simulates all of the optics of the instrument, the sensors, um, any electronics and processing that gets done. This includes uh, calibration stages, as well as any image of processing that might need to get done, such as averaging or Fourier transforms, those kinds of things. And then as the output of this, we get the simulated uh, level one data. So it's a calibrated signal that could be used um, in a actual retrieval. So together, this composes the forward model for our simulator, and it takes the atmospheric scene and generates a level one product. And this is really good at investigating 
instrument parameters like noise levels and, and those kinds of things. But to understand the full picture, then we also have to do the inverse as well. So this is then taking the simulated level one data, running it through our, the various retrieval algorithms to produce synthetic level two data products. And so then with this, we can really kind of close the loop and we can compare these level two data products with our input atmospheric scenes to understand uncertainty on the measurements, uh, what biases might be arising, uh, resolutions, those kinds of things. And critically, what we can also do now is use these instrument simulators to tweak the optics or change out sensors, those kinds of things, and see what impact those changes have um, on the level two data product. So that's the, the project in a nutshell and uh, what the simulators are gonna do and what they have been doing. And so now I'll just kind of talk briefly about the three instruments and uh, some results from, these, from this project. So the aerosol limb imager, as Thomas mentioned, will take two dimensional images of the limb as it orbits. And that's what's shown on the right here. And then along the way, it'll take a snapshot and that's what's shown kind of in the inset here. So it'll do this at um, several wavelengths between about 600 and 1600 nanometers. And then it'll also take these images at two different polarization states, so vertical and horizontal polarization. And together, this will provide really good information on uh, vertical profiles of aerosol extinction, as well as providing information on particle size and uh, cloud, to cloud top detection and discrimination on what's cloud and what's aerosol. And so this is kind of the, the internals of the LE instrument that we're modeling. And at its core, it's a, a two-channel design. So radiance comes in the front end, and then we use a beam, beam splitter to separate that into um, a short wavelength channel, so less than 950 nanometers, and a long wavelength channel greater than 950 nanometers. And this lets us kind of optimize the different components uh, for the different wavelength ranges. And then there's kind of two most important components, I guess, would be the liquid crystal rotator, which does the polarization selection, and then the, the acoustic optic tunable filter, which is what does the wavelength selection. So this is what we're modeling in LE, and then each component is modeled individually, so we can kind of change the parameters of each component or swap them out and test to see how they're changing things. Uh, and then in terms of the results, so this is just an example of one of the retrievals we've done from one of the input scenes. So on the, the left panel here, we've got kind of the, the true atmospheric scene that we're inputting in red as the aerosol. And then in this scene, there's a, a pretty thick cloud down at around 13 kilometers. And then the retrieve state is shown as the, the blue line here. And we can see that the accuracy um, is really good. It's hitting, it's meeting all of our target requirements. We're getting a vertical resolution um, of 500 meters or better for the majority of the aerosol layer, which is great. And then also once we hit the cloud top, it gets too thick for the limb uh, retrieval to really do a good job. But um, importantly, we're using that polarization information to distinguish the cloud top so we know where to cut off the retrieval and we can distinguish uh, between stratospheric aerosols and clouds. So um, that's the, the aerosol limb imager. And then the next step is spatial heterodyne observations of water or show. And the approach here is to take interferogram images of the limb and in a vibrational band of water around 1,365 nanometers. And so the, the kind of um, observational steps here then are shown at the, in the bottom panel. So on the left, we've got an interferogram of the limb. And then this is inverted to produce uh, vertical profiles of radiance uh, in the spectrum. And then this radiance spectrum is inverted uh, to produce vertical profiles of water on the right here. And this technique gives really good sensitivity to low uh, water concentrations in the UTLS where things are highly variable um, and really not well pinned down at the moment. So it's a, a pretty critical observation of water. And kind of the, the way it does this is using a, a field-wide spatial heterodyne spectrometer. And so this is kind of the main component of show. And that's what's shown on the right here. So there's some imaging optics, um, of course, and then there's an anamorphic front optics, which averages all the spatial variations in the horizontal scene. So you get a single uh, profile for show. 
And then as with LE, each of these components are modeled in software so we can kind of tweak them up and see what changes. And then also show has a little bit more complex processing because it's an interferogram. It has to um, do some additional image transforms and calibrations to get to the level one radiance. And that's all simulated in software as well. And then in terms of the results, here's an example retrieval of a show water vapor profile. So on the left is the, the retrieval itself. And then the second panel here, this shows the retrieval error. So generally everything's looking really good. We've got errors less than about 0.1 or 0.2 PPM, which is hitting targets. And then on the right, we see the uh, vertical resolution of this uh, retrieval. So in the UTLS below about 20, we're at 500 meter res vertical resolution or better. And then above 20, it starts to get a little bit coarser resolution. Um, the signal at those altitudes is quite a bit lower, so we have to do some longer uh, spatial averaging, which degrades the resolution a bit, but things are much less uh, inhomogeneous at those altitudes, so that uh, isn't a bad trade-off to make. Um, and then the, the third instrument I'll talk about is the thin ice clouds in the far infrared emissions, or tick fire. And so this is also an imaging instrument, um, but as Thomas mentioned, it looks in the Nadir view. So this is a radiometer that measures eight channels from about four microns to 100 microns with a uh, footprint of about 550 to 100 kilometers, uh, depending on the wavelength and a, a horizontal resolution of about one to five kilometers. And these channels give really good information and high sensitivity to ice crystal size, cloud phase, optical depth, temperature, and humidity. And then because each channel is sensitive to slightly different altitudes, you also get some uh, vertical profiling capability as well. And so that's what's shown on the right here um, is the different channels and then uh, how that signal changes um, with the single scattering albedo. So just how sensitive it is to a particular uh, cloud particle parameter. So the instrument design for tick fire, um, it uses a filter wheel to select the different wavelength bands. And then the imaging is done using a, a microbolometer array that's been coated with gold black to improve absorption. And there's also some calibration um, stages in the instrument. So you get a, a two point calibration system. And then uh, as with Ali and Show, all the different components are, are modeled individually and it's already been used in some, to support some phase zero studies to try out some different filter specifications and evaluate their performance. And then this is an example of the tick fire retrieval using the um, some ice cloud properties from a calypso scene that we we've used as the input. Um, and so basically two minutes, looking... Landon. Perfect. Thanks, Kaylee. Um, so this is just the the retrieval of the ice cloud effective radius, and everything's looking really good um, here. We also get a coarse vertical resolution of cloud and water uh, at about two kilometers from tick fire in the retrieval. So. Everything looks great there. And just to wrap it up, I'll just say that uh, all three instruments now have end-to-end uh, -end simulators that have been implemented. Um, we've tested out the instrument performance with them and uh, everything seems to be looking really good. So with that, I will finish there and open up to questions at this time. Good, thanks, Landon. Questions for Landon? We have a quiet crowd here this morning. So Landon, what's the heaviness of the, the calculations? Is it something that um, if you wanted to just switch out a detector, would that be months of calculation, days of calculation? Uh, it depends a little bit on, yeah, how much you want to do to get, um, a single profile retrieval for LE, it would be pretty quick. It would be, um, you're looking at probably like minutes to hours of calculation. Okay, thanks. Good, okay. Jan, do you wanna to try to share your screen? Yes, sure. Okay, yeah. Good, it's coming up. Okay, so our third speaker this morning 
And our final talk on the Hawk mission is by Jan Blanchard, uh, talking about the applications of these simulators. Go ahead, Jan. Yeah, thank you, Helen. So I will continue on the same uh, topic of Hawk. And yeah, today I will present some applications of the simulators, especially on uh, UTLS studies, so upper, upper troposphere and lower troposphere studies. So I would like to thank uh, my co-author on that. I just wanted to show you this plot on showing the different satellites measuring the same air mass. And that's really a key point to have a coincident and collocated uh, measurements uh, there. So to, to remind the motivation, so you, uh, yeah, I will try to, to summarize uh, this slide here. So we want to combine the limb view of aerosol and water vapor with Nadia looking uh, images uh, from the TIG fire. And the, the, the objective is to get better understanding of the, of the intera interaction between uh, aerosol clouds, yeah, water vapor, and their feedback processes on radiation and cl climate forcing. And the objective of the different instrument is to get uh, more accurate and uh, with high vertical resolution aerosol, uh, water vapor. Also, um, yeah. we, we need the water vapor to, to get uh, better information about the cloud dynamics and aerosol processing. And we need the cloud information, information to better understand the nucleation to precipitation processes and also the interaction between aerosol and uh, ice nucleation. And at the end, we want to collect uh, collocative data for studies of aerosol cloud dehydration and radiation interaction. And one of the objective is to improve the parameterization is in the atmospheric models. And or, uh, Thomas already mentioned that, but I think the, the key point is the Hawk instrument are highly synergistic. So if you look at the right, you will see that uh, for, for this portion of the atmosphere between 5 and 35 kilometer in, uh, in height, so we can see the uh, aerosol, uh, the stratosphere, the aerosol profile in orange, the water vapor profile in blue, and the cloud, which is uh, in gray there. And TIG fire will look at the nadir, will provide some information on cloud optical depths, cloud particle size, cloud altitude, and uh, radiative forcing, and then long wave radiative forcing. And Ali will look at the aerosol profile, and show will look at the water vapor profile. And if, yeah, if you look at the logo, so you will recognize some of the shapes uh, of this uh, synergy plot. So the, the key here is, uh, those three instruments are very well suited for the UTLS studies, where the, the processes are quite slow, especially in cold and dry condition. And it favors measure, measurements on processes like ice, ice nucleation. And I'm still talking about synergy here because there are different levels of synergy. So first, as you saw before, it will provide uh, the first ever coincident measurements for better understanding the interaction between aerosol cloud and water vapor. But also there are some different kinds of synergy in the retrieval algorithm. So I will show you later that uh, doing the synergy will improve um, and reduce the uncertainty of level two products. And we also think of uh, joint retrievals. So for example, I crystal shape, where we can use the uh, Ali uh, polarization information along with the TIG fire which is sensitive to the shape of the particles. So today I will present some of the application uh, in this UTLS, especially in the aerosol cloud interaction and the feedback in the uh, IR about the deep convection overshooting and moistening uh, and dense water vapor profiling near the tropopause region. And also one other application, but I won't uh, talk about that today is the polar stratospheric clouds. Yeah, oops. Uh, I'm not sure if you are able to see the title here. Uh, so it's an application on aerosol, cloud, water, precipitation, and radiation interaction. So this is a scene, a very interesting scene, uh, where the Calypso overpass is superimposed with the OMPS uh, overpass. 
And you can see in blue, it's uh, correspond to the aerosol clouds and light precipitation from Calypso. So this is the extinction uh, there. And in orange, it's uh, the stratospheric aerosol from OMS. And we also use uh, ERA-5 for the water vapor. And here it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting scene because you can see at different for different systems, the interaction between the uh, aerosol and the clouds. So we want to look at the ice nucleation uh, in for these different uh, type of systems. And here, so you can see a, like a, a summary of the different interaction that I will go into the detail in, in the next slide. So the first plot on the left is uh, the Ali uh, aerosol extinction. And you can see in gray, it's uh, the, the cloud, so it's a mask below, but you can see the, the plume of uh, aerosol in the stratosphere and the higher value close to the, the clouds, close to the tropopod there. But what I want to point here, it's uh, the, 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 the latitude here, the plot along the latitude where you can see in orange, it's the OMS uh, retrieval. So it's, it's uh, the truth. And in blue, it's uh, the retrieved from Ali. And in green, it's the Calypso value. So you can see that uh, the, the current instrument, the Calypso, is missing a lot, large part of aerosol uh, for, for this track. And on the right, so we want to look at the cloud relative forcing uh, due to the interaction and also the effect on the ice effective radius. So you can see in red, it's the effective radius. And in blue, it's uh, the cloud relative forcing. And in green, so it's the Ali. Uh, our aerosol optical depths there. But I just want to mention that for this case, so we are quite limited by the current knowledge and of the, and the, the current retrieval algorithm we use. So this, is, this represents the truth we use in the simulator, but we expect that the instrument will bring new knowledge, new knowledge uh, for this kind of seeds. So just to, to test the simulator. So this was the first uh, type of synergy, but we, as we mentioned before, uh, Ali has the ability to detect a cloud top. So you can see uh, Ali line of sight here. It's due to the, thanks to the dual polariz polarization information, we can detect the cloud top in, in white. And doing that, so we can uh, input this information into the tick fire retrieval to improve uh, the retrieval there. So it has different effects. The first is to reduce the uncertainty of the retrieval. So you can see in blue, it corresponds to the you know, classic uh, retrieval algorithm. So without any other information, and it speaks about 10% of the uh, uh, uncertainty of the effective radius, effective diameter. And if we input the Ali information, so it will uh, improve the uncertainty there. It also increased the number of uh, retrieve profile, so where we uh, get to the convergence and reduce the number of iterations. Uh, so another uh, scene we are looking at and another uh, application we are interested in, it's uh, on a convective overshooting and moistening uh, in the, the stratosphere. So for this scene, we use the GameMac simulation. So it was the, provided by the Yi Wang's group at the McGill. And here, so we look at the long wave relative forcing and cloud properties. And Sho is looking at the water vapor. Yeah. So in the center, I want to highlight the cloud top height. And you can see the, the overshooting, the, the, the cloud top at uh, some place um, around uh, 49 uh, degree north. And if we look at the subset in the red the rectangle, so this corresponds to, uh, to the current uh, swath and uh, on one image of the tick fire measurements. And on the right, so this is the output from the simulators. So it includes all the errors we, are, we, we put into the simulator and all of those measurements, all of the, the simulation. And you, can, you are looking at the brightness temperature at only one channel. And we are able to, to see uh, the, the shape of the, the, of the, the, the different cloud top there. So we know that show is very sensitive to, uh, to water vapor to, at low concentration. And here I 
this is this corresponds on the left uh, the, on a cross track of the, the previous scene. And the, as you can see, so the, the plume of water vapor is there. And using the averaging kernels for show, we are able to see the same kind of uh, structure uh, of, of water vapor there. So that's one of the, the interesting results. But if we if we add uh, aerosol and cloud information from Ali and Tickfire, we are able to improve and uh, reduce the uncertainty of the retrieval there. So if you are looking here on this plot, so you will see that the show baseline is uh, the gray, uh, the, the, the black uh, plot here. But when we add uh, Hawk cloud and aerosol information, we are getting closer to the truth. And if we are looking at the error, you can see that we go from 10% to less than 5% when we use the Ali and Tickfire information. And on the other way, so getting a better uh, water vapor profile uh, will improve uh, tick fire retrieval. So here uh, we try different type of atmosphere where we uh, modeled atmosphere. So we do the retrieval for GEM, ERA-5, and the, the tropical uh, standard atmosphere. And when we add show, so there, there is an increase of the Shannon information content, and it slightly improved the retrieval. So this is only for one profile, but yeah, we expect that uh, it will improve for different type of uh, scenes and, the, the, and reduce uncertainty. And one of the synergy I was talking about is a joint retrieval. So I just want to give you a sense of how it can uh, work. So as we, we mentioned before, show, show is very sensitive to low water vapor concentration using uh, limb scatter sunlight in the vibration belt of water. And you can see here the raging kernel of show. So using an interferometer is very sensitive and able to get a high vertical resolution. And on the right, so we, the, the fine infrared band are very sensitive uh, to the water vapor concentration due to uh, the continuum of water vapor. So from band five to band eight, you can see that uh, the, the transmittance it decreases and it uh, actually block. We are not able to see below uh, some certain value. And this is for different scenes, so tropical scene and atmospheric uh, Arctic winter scene. And if we look at the weighting function, so you can see that we see that there are some peaks at a different lat different altitude depending on the the bands uh, we use there. So I just want to mention that uh, this tick fire instrument is it's not the prime objective to get the water vapor profile, but at least we can use information to get more uh, vertical information of water vapor. So the five, the four bands are very sensitive at different altitude, and band one, uh, so it's for four from four to eight micron, so it covers the traditional six point two uh, wavelength. Uh, microwave uh, window that, was, that is used for the water vapor. So you can see we, it's the, the green profile is like more, uh, more scattered. And uh, yeah, it will give in some information about uh, integrated water vapor in the upper part of the tree. So uh, one Jan, idea is, yeah. You got, you got a minute left. Yeah, perfect. So a uh, show provides a dense water, uh, dense sampling down to three kilometers below, below tropopause or cloud top uh, with high vertical resolution. And Tickfire will provide a coarser vertical resolution, but at least the horizontal resolution and the cross track will be very interesting to, 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 to improve the retrieval there. So we can think of joint retrieval with the optimal estimation method. And just to give you an example here, so we can see in black, it's a era five and show is able to follow this profile. And we can add uh, some tick fire information uh, along the profile. So to, to go uh, close to, to three kilometers. So to summarize, uh, HOC will uh, enable new knowledge of cloud aerosol water vapor interaction processes in the TLS. So we want to look at the 
relation between aerosol properties, ice nucleation, and feedbacks in radiation. Also, convective moistening and envol cloud properties. Uh, the end-to-end -end simulator has been developed, has been developed to advance science. And one thing I want to mention, it's I was talking only about the three instruments, but we are also thinking about the synergy with the AOS P1 instrument, and there are a lot of uh, applications and opportunities there. And we are very excited because uh, we will be able to use the simulator and compare with the aircraft measurements uh, that is planned for 2023. And if you want to have more information about the scientific motivation, I just want to say that uh, Jean-Pierre Blanchet is going to give a talk on uh, the scientific motivation this afternoon. Thank you. And if you have any question, please let me know. Good. Thanks very much, John. So we do have a couple questions. Um, let's go to Colin first. Colin, do you want to ask verbally? Thanks, Jan. Um, you said that you could measure low concentrations of water vapor. Can you quantify that? How low can you measure or what dew point temperature is the lowest that can be observed or will be able to be observed? Yeah, so if we are looking at, maybe this, maybe this one <laughs> will show better. So the, the, the show instrument uh, is able, to, depending on the profile, so is able to cover from few uh, ppmv to 100 of ppmv and for tick fire that really depend on the, the on the band we use but there is a continuity there so i i hope this plot can give you some answer and i don't know if maybe uh, if jeff yeah. want to add something thank you i think i've written my question before i saw that plot okay. yeah <laughs> yeah jan i just just wanted to make make sure i could clarify it goes from point one PPMV to 100 PPMV. Zero, 0 0.1 would be the lowest we're, we're targeting. Thanks. Good. Okay, thanks. Another question from Barbara. Yes, I wanted to know if uh, the measurements, once they are made available, come with an estimate of the, of the uncertainty associated to them. That would be super useful, for example, for uh, verification practices, and, and I'm sure more many more yes yeah, so we will uh, we are both uh, all the three instruments are using uh, optimal estimation methods so we include the error and uncertainty of the the measurements and also also uncertainty data so we provide some estimate of the uncertainty uh, with the retrieval thanks good thanks and a question from Yi. Oh, hi, uh, thanks. Uh, it took me a while to find the unmute button. Um, uh, question for Yan about the synergistic retrieval. Can you outline what exact uh, uh, geophysical variables are targeted there? For, uh, you mean for the, the joint retrieval or for? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, one thing we want to look at it's uh, the ice crystal shape. So we know that it does. Uh, some effect on the, 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 the radiation, the, the radiative forcing. And we think that using the polarization uh, from Ali, and because TIGFIRE is uh, measuring different wavelengths and uh, the, the sense, single scattering albedo is different uh, depending on the wavelength. So we think that we can use uh, this to, to, to tackle the question about the uh, ice crystal shape. Uh, yeah. uh, if some, you have some uh, more ideas, we would be happy to, to work on, yeah, on the, to collaborate on the applications. Good. Okay, just quickly, one last question then from Alejandro. Thank you. Uh, Jan, I, I was wondering, uh, in fact, how do we evaluate the accuracy of tick fire for the estimations of effective size? Do we use uh, measurements from uh, in situ, like plane, or what, what do what do we use as a reference in that case? Yeah, so it's a, a very interesting question. So, because AOS is a composed of a lidar and radar, so we will be able to have uh, information about the vertical profile and the of, yeah, of the size of particles. So we can look at that, and TIGFIRE can be used as 
the radiation can be used as a reference to do the radiation closure. So that's one point. But before that, uh, the ER2 flight, we are planning to use some aircraft to look at the, the retrieval and to go over some station, ground base station, so to, to validate uh, the effective radius compared to the profile of the active instrument we use uh, either on board or on, at ground base. And I, I guess at some point they will have some uh, yeah, aircraft uh, campaign to, so as Thomas mentioned before, uh, we need some in situ information also to validate and to, to, to the, those retrieval. Great, thanks. Good. Okay, thanks everyone. Kaylee, we're just a few minutes early. Should we just continue with Colin's talk? Well, techni help? technically, we are supposed to have a 10 minute break, which we've eaten up most of by having a good discussion. Okay. So what I was going to propose is that we take a five minute break, just so that people can get up, stretch their legs, do what they need to do. And so we will meet back here for Colin's talk. I'm just trying to do this in yep. 923. 923. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Sounds Saskatch good. one time you and then it. shift from there. Okay. Thank Thanks, everyone. See you soon.
Okay, I think it's time. Shall we get started? Yep. Uh, welcome back, everyone, for the second half. And over to you, Adam. Okay, Colin, if you're ready to go, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Kaylee. Thank you, Adam. And good morning, everyone, or good evening, uh, Kaylee. Um, and I'd like to, we're joining you here from the University of Victoria, where I'm an associate professor. And here we acknowledge and respect the Lagonquin people on whose traditional territory the university stands. And the song here is the Squimalt and Sanishne peoples, whose historical relationships with the land continues to this day. And I'd like to share with you some, some work that we've been doing on trying to better understand Earth's relative humidity. And that's been done with a postdoc, Carsten Abraham, and research assistant, Maura Dewey. So um, let's uh, motivate that. And understanding the relative humidity is such a key control on um, uh, the climate of the Earth. Indeed, it's Nobel Prize winning physics. Um, the first paper which got the climate sensitivity right used a constant profile of relative humidity, which was a straight line from the surface decreasing with altitude. Um, and that got the climate sensitivity right. And that was just such a key uh, development in climate science. Now, if we go on and motivate a little more, I came into this problem from having been working in planetary science where I was looking at the runaway greenhouse. That's where if you get a warm, moist atmosphere, you get a limit on the amount of outgoing long wave radiation to space. Um, and that temperature that it occurs at isn't actually a lot higher than Earth tropics. So we started probing that by looking at satellite observations in the, uh, in the tropics of the Earth and realized what we're looking at there wasn't quite getting to the runaway greenhouse, which is a very good thing, but looking at the super greenhouse, which is where there's a transient decrease in OLR with temperature with a warming atmosphere, and that they correlated with deep convection. So in the top left-hand plot, you can see that Earth's outgoing long-wave radiation with sea surface temperature is lin approximately linear in sea surface temperature until it isn't. And when it isn't, is accompanied by, which we can see here in the top left plot, a very nonlinear moistening of the atmosphere. So in the bottom left plot, you see the column water of vapor, and there's a nonlinear moistening of that, just around 295 to 300. And that's what gives that decrease in OLR. Now, if we look at the right, we use some models, and those are the, shown with the gray lines, of different constant relative humidities. And we can see that the OLR is consistent with a decrease in, an increase of in relative humidity from about 20% to 80%, and that'll be at the height of effective emission. As you increase sea surface temperature from, you know, 295 to 305 or 310. So that, that's from a paper in 2018, and we, we wanted to understand this more. So we went on to look at the climatology of water vapor from satellite data more. So this is what we're, I'm going to be mainly talking about to you today, which is performing a clustering analysis of relative humidity profiles. Uh, we're using uh, data from AIR, the version 7 level 2, um, and that's on fixed pressure levels um, up to maybe just above the, the tropopause. Um, and we used all the, all the good or better data, so that's 450 million profiles. And the distribution is on the figure on the right. So that's mainly showing up for the low and mid latitude troposphere. Um, we don't have Hawk yet, of course, so we're not doing um, high altitude. Um, and there's a lot of data. So uh, what my postdoc, Carson Abraham, who's now moved on to ECCC, uh, brought in was some excellent machine learning techniques called, and in this case, a, a k-mean profile clustering, where we could tell it the number of profiles we wanted, and they'll trial and error to find what the most physically meaningful number of profiles was. And then the technique will automatically cluster each and every one of those profiles into one of, say, eight groups uh, without specifying in advance what that profile should look like. This is a really powerful technique to say, 
what are the characteristic primitive classes of this um, data? So let's show you what we did. And this is a very busy figure. The first two rows are what the profiles look like, a schematic and in the second row, the actual profiles. So I'll give you a quick guide here. Profiles one and two, uh, they're deep convection. Profile four and five, they're descending air in the, in the subtropics. And then uh, A6, A7, A8, they're mid-latitude profiles I won't talk about very much. A7, that is the Manavian Weathervald 1967 profile that just pops out of our analysis. Curiosity, it only really exists in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, funny that. Um, A3 is a mix of, you know, air going up, air coming down. And let's look at the bottom of this. The, um, the precipitable water, second from the bottom, the red is what we see in that profile. As you can see, as we go to hotter profiles, the amount of precipitable water goes down in each case. And then the OLR, again, goes, uh, does these funny super greenhouse things. So A1 and A2 are super greenhousey, and the rest are back on this linear trend. So let's look at where we find these. And they have really characteristic uh, spatial distribution. So going down the page in profiles here. Um, so the middle is, of course, geographic. We see A1 beautifully centered on the warm pool, A2 much more characterizing the ITCZ. Uh, and so on. A5, for example, is really in the stratocumulus regions over upwellings. Um, and then on the right hand side, we have latitude and sea surface temperature in those paddles. So we see the very systematic change with going to cooler profiles of where they exist. So this is just exceptionally beautiful ability to cluster these raw profiles into something really physically meaningful. Um, then what we did was look at the annual cycle, and this is, this is really quite interesting. The, um, again, we're going down in profile types. Um, A1 is really dominated by a, uh, an annual cycle uh, um, where it's all about a peak in Northern Hemisphere summer, in the, in the warm pool. Whereas A2, which is much more following the ITCZ, um, has a semi-annual signal, you know, with the maximum phase lagging the equinox of by about a month. So that's when you've got the ITCZ stationary and it's really warmed up, uh, that's when you'll get the most of, of those. Um, and then you can, you know, clearly see there's some correlations between just by looking at these different profile types. One of the other things we can start to see here is, for example, A1 starts to, in does increase very slightly through the period that we have here, also A2. And if you remember, they're the profiles associated with deep convection and also associated with the super greenhouse, where we get less radiation out for the amount for the sea surface temperature. That, that's gonna be a key part of the global warming signal. So here are our seasonal cycles again, just in maps, profiles go down, seasons go across. And I won't labor this too much, but you can see really beautiful seasonal patterns pop out of these. Okay, I'll go on to what the trends are over the time. And the colors here represent um, from yellow in 2003 to darker colors in 2020. Um, the seasonal cycle for each year. And you can see that sea surface temperature in, diff in later years, it's warmer. You can see a real trend on the right panel. Precipital water, we've got more trend on the right panel. OLR in the middle, well, we don't change that. And why that's happening is that we're going to more of these super greenhouse things where we warm up, but we don't get more radiation out. And again, that's really important for understanding global warming. We also can see in this data, beautiful uh, ENSO signals here. So we're La Nina right now. So profiles are going down the page. Um, 
Neutral is in the middle and in La Nina, where we are now, for example, the bigger fig live more they want. Um, so that's a red anomaly, a positive anomaly over the warm pool here. And here over BC, what that means is we're just getting hammered. We're still getting atmospheric rivers coming in here in June, which is what we get for La Nina. And that has very important consequences for here. Show you um, last, there's an MJO signal here as well, which is again quite beautiful. In this case, profiles are going across from left to right. And again, let's just look at A1 on the left. We see that positive anomaly, so that's more deep convection moving across the um, uh, Pacific as we go down. Um, and I'll just come on to some conclusions here. Um, and the references to the papers at the bottom, there's uh, one paper published, two papers published, and then the, the third one looking at the seasonal cycle, that's uh, submitted. Um, so we can take these vast amounts of satellite data and use a machine learning technique to characterize them into things which are really physically meaningful. Uh, we can see changes in the structure of relative humidity on interannual, annual, and intraannual time scales. There's a little bit of evidence of a secular increase on this, even on a 20 year um, time scale. Um, so just finally, I'd like to, to thank the funders and the primary funding here has come from the space agency through the Earth System Science Data Analysis. And I'm just really so grateful for that because it allowed me as someone coming from a slightly different field to move into satellite data uh, analysis and then bring some HQP along in the process. So just that process to allow new investigators in Canada to get funded for um, hypothesis-driven research is, is so important. So I would like to thank our program managers. I know some of whom are here. Thank you, everyone. Good, thank you, Colin. Questions nice, for Colin? Nicely to time, thank you. Good. Alejandro, I see a, uh, a hand up. Yes, Colin, uh, thanks for the presentation, super nice. Uh, I was wondering if you plan are planning to extend the analysis to land grid points, of obviously maybe using some other data. Is um, that? I think that that would be interesting to think about. At the moment, there's not the HQP or the funding to do that. Um, but if you know anyone who'd like to do that and wants to get in touch and, you know, we could maybe uh, see if we could help out or that, that may be a future project in a, in a year or so. Good. Thanks. A question from Yi. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, in some of our early studies of the uh, super greenhouse effect, we find it's typical, maybe necessary uh, for the profile to transition from a subsidence uh, dominated uh, to a convective dominated profile. So I just wonder, since you have characterized the profiles, relative humidity profiles in different categories, did you, did you also observe a similar transition? Is it not necessary condition? Yeah, so thanks, that's a really good, question I really appreciate, and, and we spent a lot of time in the paper on that. What we, it really, super greenhouse is, is really dominant in profiles uh, A2 and A1. And what we see is with a warming uh, sea surface, there's a transition to warmer profiles, you know, less, less and less A3, more A2, more and more A1. And then as you get to, the warmest temperatures, you're mostly in A1, and then most of that is, um, is in super greenhouse. So we, uh, we, we've got some figures in the, uh, in the first paper that published, I think, uh, that's just out, I can send you a copy of that as well, Yi, where we, we, we treat that and we show the amount of profiles that are in super greenhouse increases within profile as sea surface temperature increases, as well as the switch between profiles. And I think that's something that's actually really worth talking about is what we see is across time and space, these characteristic profiles don't change very much. There's actually real physics that drives, you'll have profiles, let's say 
A5 for physical reasons. So what changes with time and space is which profile you have, not really what the profile looks like in terms of relative humidity, but which profiles you sample is really how we characterize the atmosphere. Good, okay, thank you, Colin. We should move on. Okay, Han, you're up next. If you could take control and share your screen, please. Okay, sure. Good, thanks. And Han will speak to us today about variability of outgoing long wave radiation. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Han Huang, a postdoc from McGill University. Um, today, I would like to share some recent work of our team on the spatial temporal variability of the outgoing long wave radiation in the far infrared. So I will start with this figure, and it's a long wave spectral flux in our sky. Um, so the integration of the lines along with the X axis here is what we commonly call as outgoing long wave radiation, which is usually around 240 watts per square meters in all sky. And for the far infrared that I am going to mainly focus on in this talk, it usually refers to the spectral region of wave number less than 660 or the uh, regions uh, left to this uh, vertical line here. And then there comes a question, uh, why do we care about far infrared? Um, many previous studies have shown the importance of far infrared. Uh, for example, like uh, the far infrared account for about 45% of the total outgoing long wave radiation and is, is especially sensitive to atmospheric water vapor and cloud. So the investigations in FIR could potentially improve the retrieval of their information. And besides, uh, this figure on the left also suggests that the fraction of FIR varies with regions. Uh, like we can see here, a relatively higher fraction of FIR in the polar regions uh, compared with global mean results. So this emphasizes the predominant importance of far infrared and the possibility to detect the surface properties in these cold regions. And some other interesting scientific questions associated with far infrared, like uh, what's the geographic distribution of the far infrared and what are the critical layers that contribute most to, uh, to the far infrared um, are all remain to be answered. Um, and given the importance of the far infrared why the direct observations of far infrared in the past were, were, were limited, so this is mainly due to the either the like technical restrictions or maybe less recognized necessity of ob observing far infrared. But in recent years, um, in recognition of the importance of far infrared, uh, there are several uh, observational projects are to be launched in near future, like the uh, tick fire project by the Canadian Space Agency and the forum funded by the European Space Agency and the prefire by US NASA. So all these investigations will help to improve our understanding in far infrared, um, especially in polar climate, and offer direct observations to better constrain the simulations of radi radiative fluxes by radiative transfer models. Um, and on another side, uh, or from climate perspective, um, this figure shows the energy budget flows in the Earth's climate system. And the right part in this figure is the OLR that we just talked about. Um, and in addition to the questions related to the far infrared mentioned before, uh, like some interesting questions here, like the total OLR is about 240 watts per square meters, but how much the contribution um, is from different spectral bands. And also here, uh, this figure shows that the transmitted surface emissions with the atmospheric window is fully watts per square meters, then how accurate the number is, or what will the surface contribution be for the whole long wave band. And also here it shows a, a, a total atmospheric contribution, but what is the contribution from each atmospheric layer, and can we have a vertical profile of atmospheric contribution to the total OER at TOA, um, and to see how it varies vertically? So in summary, here are some questions we aim to answer here, uh, like what's a spectral contribution to OER and what's the respective atmospheric and surface contribution? Um, and also what are the 
uh, critical atmospheric layers in different spectral regions. Um, and to provide some prior knowledge for those satellite missions, our focus here will be in the far infrared region. Okay, so here comes the methodology. Um, yeah, our, our method is based on this discrete form of radiation transfer equation, which consists of two parts. One is surface contribution, and another is atmospheric contribution. And to clarify first, by saying the contribution, I'll be referring to how much of the emission can reach the TOA. Uh, for example, like the emission by surface could be like 100 watts per square meters, but only 20 watts per square meters can reach the TOA due to the absorption by the atmosphere. And so in this case, the surface contribution is 20 watts per square meters. Um, and we use a radiation transfer model RTMG to simulate a one year long wave spectral uh, radio flux in 2013 uh, over the whole globe with a six alveolar instantaneous profile from EIA5. Um, and according to the definition in RTMG, the total LR in our work is defined as a band of wave number from 10 to 30 to 50. And the far infrared is defined as a, um, the sum of those bands of wave number smaller than 630. And the mid infrared is represented by the sum of the rest of the bands. Okay. Um, now let's look at the zonal distribution of the total OLR and FIR first. So let's look at panel A first. The solid line here is the result in all sky and dashed line in clear sky. So the blood line in panel A is the zonal mean distribution by total OLR across the latitudes. And this is what we all quite familiar with. So what we are going to focus on here is uh, uh, this red line here the distribution of FIR, which is much flatter. And then we can look at the panel B here. So panel B here shows the FIR fraction, in, uh, shows that the FIR fraction increases with the latitudes, uh, like due to the displacement of wind's law. Um, and many studies have noticed this interesting phenomena here, but by dissecting the atmospheric and surface contribution, what is newly found here is that the relatively higher far infrared fraction at the poles is mainly due to the enhanced surface contribution. Although if we compare the red lines and blue lines here, the atmospheric contribution generally surpasses the strength of surface contribution. And this table here summarizes the contribution in different spectral bands and from the, uh, from the atmosphere or surface to total OLR. Um, and from global mean perspective here, over 80%, we can look at the last, lot, uh, last uh, rows here, over 80% of, uh, of the total OLR originates from the atmosphere and 45% of it lies in the FIR. So given the importance of the atmospheric contribution, uh, I will next show the vertical distribution of the atmospheric uh, contribution. Okay. So this is the key result we have in this uh, work. It's a layer-wise atmospheric contribution. Um, for the panel A and panel B, the y-axis represents the pressure and the x-axis represents the band limits. And panel A is about the layer-wise atmospheric contribution per unit thickness. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, sorry, the result here is based on global mean. Um, and the contour values here represents the contributions uh, of each layer to the total, uh, uh, to the TOA. So uh, it show, in panel A, it shows that the critical layers represent by these big values that contribute most to the OLR strongly varies in height uh, in different spectral bands. Like for example, in FIR, um, where the wave number is smaller than 630, the contribution is mainly emitted from the middle and upper portion of the troposphere. Uh, well, in the CO2 absorption band, the uh, contribution peaks in the stratosphere. And in the vinyl region, uh, in mainly uh, located in the lower troposphere. And here, uh, now we can look at panel B here. It's a band integrated result in this three bands, the total FIR and MIR. So the black line here is the broadband atmospheric contribution. 
um, it's uniform throughout most of the atmosphere. Well, if we look at the red line and blue lines here, uh, the peak of FIR and MIR is located in the upper and lower troposphere, respectively. And there are two peaks in this, uh, two local peaks in this black lines here at 200, 900 hectopascal. And this is uh, due to the existence of a cloud. And further, we can look at this mid local minimum value at the trouble post. Uh, it, uh, we, um, it suggests that the list of photons received by satellites from this layer and why it is difficult to sound the satellite uh, to sound this layer by satellite observations. And panel C here shows the comparison between surface contribution and the vertically integrated atmospheric contribution. So in far infrared, there is little surface contribution due to the high opacity of the atmosphere. While in the window region, as the atmosphere is more transparent, the surface contribution is largely enhanced, but still weaker than the atmospheric contribution. Okay, uh, next. Uh, we will further show the zonal variations of the atmospheric contribution in total OER. So the contour plot shows that the zonal mean layer um, contribution, it also reflects the distribution of a cloud, like here, this hot spot in, at 200 hectopascal in the tropics, which is due to the strong convection here. And we can also see a blue region right above the trouble post layer represented by this black line here. Uh, which means that the contribution around the trouble post layer shows local minimum at all latitudes. Um, yeah, and the line plots on the bottom show or contrast the vertical integrated atmospheric and surface contribution. So the atmospheric contribution shows an obvious gradient from the equator to pose, but for the surface contribution, it shows little variations. Uh, and here we further show the geographic distribution of vertical integrated atmospheric and surface contribution. So in total OR, we can first look at panel A here. Um, it's interesting to notice that the surface contribution is almost invariant with latitudes with a strength of 40 watts per square meters, excepting in those dry and high elevated regions like your, those red uh, color regions and in RDCZ. And previously there, are uh, other uh, studies on this topic, like Coe and Chambers in 1997, found the transmitted surface emission is about 40 watts per square meters. Well, um, in 2012, Coe and Shine found that estimate this uh, number to be 22, but here our, our result is 40 watts per square meters. So there indeed exist some dis discrepancies um, in terms of the surface contribution. And it also meanwhile warrants more discussion on this topic, like uh, what's the results by the simulations using other uh, RTM and data sets, and like what kind of compensation between the surface temperature and atmospheric transmittance uh, that leads to such an embarrassing 40 watts per square meters. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, next, if we look at the panel B here in FIR, uh, I mean, the surface contribution in FIR, it's worth noting that the surface contribution in FIR is only visible near the poles, indicating that the only possibility to detect the surface properties in far infrared in these regions. Um, and this can be further um, validated by the future observations. Okay, uh, so some- Hein, uh, you've got about a minute. That's what the ringing was. Okay, uh, so previous results also show the modification of clouds on the contribution uh, to OLR. So here we define the difference of uh, between all sky and clear sky as a measure of a cloud related effect. So here, this figure uh, is from global mean perspective. It, in panel A, it suggests that the atmospheric contribution is enhanced at the locations of frequent cloud occurrence, like these two levels. Um, but meanwhile, it also weakens the transmission from layer, layers below, like this blue regions. And in panel B here, it shows the vertical distribution of cloud related effect in three bands, uh, in far infrared, and in, uh, like in the far infrared, atmospheric contribution is weakened, indicated by these negative values. Um, while in mid infrared, it's uh, mostly the positive sign. 
And panel C is an integrated atmospheric contribution and surface contribution. So the surface contribution is uh, we can in each band by the existence of a cloud. But for the atmospheric contribution, it's enhanced in the uh, mid infrared, but we can in the far infrared. So overall, the cloud effect incre increase the atmospheric contribution by five watts per square meters and decrease that by, by the surface by 27 watts per square meters. Um, so to summarize, here are the key points we found in this work. Um, and all this work uh, results are based on the paper we recently sent suddenly to JGR. So if you are interested, please feel free to contact me. And thank you. Great, thank you. Very nice, Han. So a question from Jan. Go ahead, Jan. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, very interesting talk. So I had a question about the how did you simulate the surface uh, spectral emissivity? So I, I know it's a, uh, the forum team is working a lot on that, but uh, I was curious to, to know what you used in your simulation. OK. Yes, uh, in this simulation, we use uh, uh, a constant emissivity for each band. Uh, we didn't uh, distinguish like the different emissivity in different bands. Uh, and we derive the, or it, we infer the surface emissivity by using the uh, radiative flux provided by EI5. So, uh, I mean, the emissivity for the for different special bands in our simulations are the same. Okay, thank you. It's it's the new topic, <laughs> so we, we should have more interesting results uh, from the forum campaign and all the campaigns. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Time for one more talk or one more question, if there is. Okay, thanks, Han. Let's move on then. Okay, thank you. Okay, and our last talk for today is Tong Ji. Are you able to share your screen? Yeah, yeah I'm doing it right now. There. Great. Oh, okay, go ahead. Thanks very much. So hello everyone, I'm going to give you today an overview of uh, analysis of the consistency of the postulation products of uh, the Antarctic facet of North America. So, yeah, so when you're trying to assess the climate, the error of a model, you have to compare it to reference. And usually when you, in the case for, of the postulation, you're trying to compare the output of a model with the observation, but um, today there are a lot of uh, of uh, prestation projects you can use, and there are no like uh, reference within this data set. So you you need to use them like as a group, and it's really important to assess their like their consistency or their level of agreement to be sure that your result will be like conclusive or not. So, but this uh, like uh, this consistency between the products depends on a lot of factors. For for example, the, the distant metrics you're using, or like uh, which variable you you're comparing between these products. Also, the region you're carrying in your analysis on, or even some methodological choices like uh, the choice of resolution, for example. So today, I'm going, just going to give you like an overview of the uh, like um, the spatial, spatial dependency of uh, four of our metrics. And uh, how the consistency depends on like uh, uh, our used products. So about our products, we're using like uh, uh, seven position products. Uh, one based on weather observation. Next one for them based on a satellite satellite and a in situ observation. Uh, MCWP, which is like a merging of IMEG and ero 5 data, and ero 5 which is a analysis. So first, like before comparing them, we had to interpolate them like uh, to uh, like a similar grid and resolution. So we use the ERA5 grid to do so we're using a conservative interpolation. And we had like so seven products with a resolution of 0.25 uh, degree and three hours. So our study domain, as I said, was a like the Arctic facade of North America. 
but we also had to carry like our analysis with for a subdomain because next word is a product based on the word observation so we had to and the quality of the of what observation depends on the instance with the weather, weather station we so we had to like define a subdomain to to be sure that the the quality of these products is like uh, it's good to to be compared with other um the analysis was also carried on a five-year period for two, uh, 2015 2019. so but like the metrics we like comparing the products with the first one is the mean possession metrics. It's, it's quite a simple one. Just you just calculate the mean possession for a grid point and you compare it with a, another product. So it's, it's a quite regular one. The second one is the instant possession metrics. So for each grid point, you're just going to compare for each time step the estimate of the possession for two products, and you're going to sum their absolute value to have an idea of how consistent they are. Uh, estimation of the position is like a through, through time. The second one is the mean position matrix. It's just like a comparison of the intensity distribution of the mean position. So here on this graphic, you have like the intensity distribution of the mean position for the uh, multiple grid point for trim and MCWP. And as you can see, they are, like, they are not the same. So, and so the pinning presentation matrix is actually the absolute difference for each pin, the sum of the absolute difference for each pin. And this metric is able to capture how the uh, both intensities are matching or are the same or not. So, and the last one is a metric based on the intensity as a frequency of the position. Just to like give you an idea of this metric, it's quite a quite a like difficult one to introduce, but the mean prestation is like actually the product of a, the mean prestation intensity and frequency. And both of these quantity can compensate one another. So we we decide to introduce like a metric table to highlight this possible compensation between these two, can, two can, quantities. And so I'm not going to go like further in like in the introduction of this metric. I'm just going to give you like a, an idea how how, how related they, they are. So the first one has the mean prestation metric is really like a simple one. You're just comparing like total average of a uh, mean prestation. And on the other side, you have like uh, uh, the instant prestation metric, which, which is able to capture all the disparities between the between two precipitation, est precipitation estimates. But you cannot use this metric to for like a, um, a climate model, because for a climate model, you expecting like uh, your model to to be able to capture like a uh, um, climate variable and not like how and not like how it puts that for at each like uh, for uh, sorry for a time step or like a specific place so and between both of them you have the position method which is able to capture like some varieties within the like precision variability but not all of them and the last one is a, the intensity frequency metrics. It's like also able to capture some aspect of the prestation variability, but it's really hard to compare to others because it's assessing not only how like prestation occurred during the during the period, but also how many times the prestation occurs. So it's like a, this metric is also interesting, like another aspect of the prestation variability. So now just an idea of a result like uh, so here you have like four maps one for each uh, comparison matrix the mean position metrics uh, upper left meaning uh, position metrics upper right intensity frequency met metrics down uh, left and instantaneous position metric down right the first thing uh, thing i want you to, to just highlight is it's this result is only for the comparison between CMOF and gs map just I'm going to discuss other comparison later. Here you can see on the label on the bottom right of uh, each map the mean like uh, metric values of other domain. And I just want to, to show you how like it's it's really, it's really interesting to see like uh, like um, how is the status prestation is able to capture like disparities that the mean prestation metrics is not able to. You have a really strong increase in values, like from uh, ninety to uh, um, nine point two percent from for to forty 
two person. Another really interesting like uh, disparity like over the demand is like it's a really like a strong discontinuity between the the US and Canada. Over the Canadian territory, you can see like a uh, like usually higher like uh, um, metric values. Uh, than over the, the US. And we're thinking that these uh, I use like uh, values, like so this uh, lower consistency of uh, the Canyon territory is due to lower like um, weather station density, but also like different kind of correction of uh, these products over the Canyon territory. Another interesting feature is to see that here in comparison, you can see like uh, some structural elements of these prestation products. For example, here I'm, I'm pointing like a, a kind of a, a border between the, the ocean and the land. And this border is actually the uh, land ocean mask of GS map. And it's also really interesting to notice that this mask is not considering some like uh, island, for example, the Bahamas. And it's really interesting to, to see that this, uh, this, the use of this mask leads to some like uh, disparities along the coast. The last feature I really want to show you it's the, the how the station is estimated like over some lakes, and here you can see for the like Champlain that the the clim climatic variables are well oops, are consistent between the two, pro two products, the mean station, the beginning station, and the intensity frequency are associated with a, a good agreement between these two products. But for the but the instant station on the other side is not well represented. There are really some sorry, there is some really strong disparities between these two products at each time step. So now I'm just going to discuss like uh, some like uh, some like um, the, um, the values of the other comparison. So here you have like a, a graphic of uh, the, the the mean prestation value, uh, metric value for like uh, some comparison between uh, like uh, on the bottom, you have like one product and the color of the like uh, the arrow is going to give you like the other product compare with the compa product compare with. And here we can see that all the values are under 10 percent. But uh, and sorry, and it's also really interesting to see that the purple arrow like uh, which is associated to CMOF is like usually the less consistent product for like all the all the products. So. It's, it's also like it's mainly you like to do some like um, correction, like uh, issuing the correction of steam off over the north of the German. But like this story is really interesting, but it's also really interesting to compare this metric to like uh, the instant interpretation metric. And you can really see a jump in values from under, uh, under 10 percent to over 35 percent. So you can really see that the mean prestation is not able to capture like all the disparities between the products. And um, you can also see that the story changed a bit. Now the less consistent products are AR5 in pink and Trim in brown. And so, and the only exception to this result is the comparison between MCWP and AR5. And it's actually, it's, it's like this result is like due to their strong relatedness between these two products. MCWP is actually based on like AR5 data. So about the, the idea I want you to keep in mind of this presentation is you have to be really careful when you like assessing the consistency between products because this, the consistency depends on a lot of the, the use metrics, the variable you're assessing, the region, or even the product consider. And the mean prestation is not like a good variable to compare products when you're trying to like have an idea of uh, the prestation variability is uh, represented through like uh, different projects. I want also want to say that um, you have to be really careful because when you're trying to compare products like over some like structural elements, for example, uh, over the coast, you can see like some strong disparities due to like actually their construction of how they correct it. Um, I also want you to highlight that uh, most the most modern products like MX, CMOF, GSMAP, and CWP are really well, really consistent. But the next thread, which is a project based on like um, weather observation, is also really consistent with this with these products. When AR5 and Trim are not really co consistent with all these sorts of products. So that's all, and thank you for your attention. And if you want to contact us uh, 
later or just ask question right now. Here's some like oh, information. Good, thank you very much. Questions? Ah, a question from Barbara. Barbara, do you want to just go ahead and ask? Yes, I wanted to know a bit more about the binning matrix and uh, maybe its uh, its similarities with the Earth's moving distance. If you know the Earth moving distance, I was interested in that and also in the intensity frequency. If you use the fit of the jab for that one or not. Um, I don't know the moving distance, but um here it's only the like the binning precession matrix is only like a comparison of the contribution of, of uh, to the mean precession of like each um, um intensity beam so you, i don't know if it's really interesting your question but it's like really a comparison of these uh, two like uh, distribution of the mean mean precession mean precession um um, and for the like the intensity frequency matrix, it's, um, we are we are comparing like uh, the intensity and the frequency uh, estimates uh, for each product. So it's we're not like we are just having like an overview of the the intensity and the frequency of a, of a for a, for a point, and we're not looking like at a, a specific how it's distributed, for example. Okay, and how, how do you estimate this? Do you use a fit of a Jeff distribution or so on? Anyway, very nice. I really like your study, just curiosity. I wanted yes. to read. Thank you. So I think we here, which is uh, the, for, the, for example, the frequency is like the percentage of uh, wet events. So it's only like uh, we counting like uh, the number of uh, time step with presentation, like uh, uh, over a, a given threshold. And um, we just having like, we just normalize with the number of time step. Um, in this study, we also like uh, assessing the, like the sensitivity to this matrix to like the user of threshold. So yeah, so I'm not going to present this result today, but it's really interesting to, to see how like uh, some methodological, methodological choices can really impact the consistency of the product. So, yeah, perfect. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, good. I think, uh, Kaylee, I think we'll end our session there then. Yep. And we'll thank all of our presenters for excellent presentations. Yeah, thank you very much again, everyone. That was really good. Uh, so, just as a reminder, part two of the Space Based Earth Observation session starts at 1255 Saskatchewan time, which is 1455 Eastern. And in the meantime, you're encouraged to go see the plenary by Deborah Wunsch from University of Toronto, who will be talking about carbon cycle science, but using satellites and ground-based instruments. Good. Okay. See okay. you all later. Thanks very much. Bye.